how you guys doing, man? Soak that in. Soak that in. Man, I'll tell you, there's just nothing um, that can compare, thank you, to just being in the presence of God. I mean, that is transformational. Um, hey, so tonight, um, we, we're kicking off a series. On First Tuesdays, we do series, and uh, we're kicking off a series tonight that is really about freedom, and it's called Let Go. And, and everybody's got stuff that they hold on to, beliefs that they hold on to, things that they hold on to, that whether or not you realize it, it's, it's, it's inhibiting the power of God from working in your life because he's got something more powerful for you to take hold of, but you're holding on to something else instead. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about there? Okay. All right. Cool. So, um, so we're going to talk about this whole concept. And tonight what I want to do is I want to take you to something that, that is, a, is a prayer of Paul, um, and it's Paul declaring some important things. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's just kind of about getting the big picture of what it is that God uh, wants to do uh, in our world. And so this includes, of course, you and me and everything that God wants to do in it and um, in us. And so... Um, let me just jump into this. We're going to do Ephesians, okay? We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3 tonight. And by the way, let me just encourage you. First Tuesdays is a good time to bring a Bible. It's a good time to take notes and stuff like that. If you got it electronically, uh, you could do it that way too. I actually use a lot more stuff on First Tuesday than I can on Sunday because Sunday we have a mixed crowd and I got to keep it at a certain level. So tonight what I want to do is I want to jump into um, Ephesians 3 verse 6. I want you to read um, this verse with me and it starts out like this. Let's say it together. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. Now, he's talking about two groups that had nothing in common. As a matter of fact, there was nothing but uh, tension uh, between them. Uh, the Jews were taught that the Gentiles were unclean. You know, you did your business within the Jewish community. You didn't uh, associate with them. The Gentiles, they looked down their noses at the Jews, and both of them didn't want anything to do with one another. But this word keeps coming up in this passage that says both. And that both is a very important thing. A lot of times what we do is we say, hey, uh, what, is, what is God's plan for my life? And especially here in, uh, in the West, we tend to think very individualistically, don't we? I want to know what God's plan is for my life. I want to know what he wants to do in my life. But the problem is, is if you think God's plan is about your life, you don't understand what's happening. Because your plan, God's plan for you is never about you. God's plan for you is never just about you. And so, for instance, you want to find work, then don't just pray about you. Say, God, put me where you know I can impact and make a difference in the lives of other people. God, put me where you know I can bring the most good and the most value to wherever it is that I'm going to work. And if you, and if you begin to pray, understanding that there's a, there's a whole big picture to God's plan for you, you're beginning to understand God's plan for your life. But he says it's, it's, a, it's, about, it's about more than just you. It's more than just me. It's about a lot of people. It's about community. Down in verse 10, here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety. Now check this out. To all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Did you see that? God's purpose in all this and everything that he's doing is to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan. You want to know what the plan of God is? That's it. Which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you ever go, man, the world is, just doesn't make any sense to me. Right, like if God is God, then why is there so many bad things happening? Anybody struggle with that? How can horrible crimes happen if God is God? How can 
how can such hatred and bigotry and evil be in the world if God is God? How come there, how come there be so much pain in my life if God is God? Anybody ever feel that way, wrestle with those things? And so here's what he's saying, is he's saying, look, a lot of things don't make sense. That's a part of this plan. Because what God is doing is through the church, through the church, he's displaying something. And, and by the way, it's weird to think about, but you know that your life is on display all the time? Do you realize that whenever you're tempted, it's not just you. When you're tempted, there's, there, there, there are people watching. I mean, there are literally, there's things happening. There are witnesses to what's going on. When you and I, the way that we live our lives, the way we, resp we respond to adversity, the way that we respond to pain, all those things God is using to display wisdom. Because see, from the perspective of the devil and demons, they're just like, yeah, God, you really messed up, didn't you? Look at those people, they are destroying everything. Look at what a mess they are making. Look, this was such a bad idea. And God's like, you wanna, you wanna see? Let me make sense of this to you. You see, all that stuff got messed up. We know that in Genesis chapter 3. And what he's saying is, is the church is here to make sense of all this. It's the church that in how the church responds and how the church lives, it's us that God uses to display his wisdom. And so when tragedy comes, it doesn't make sense. When injustice comes, it doesn't make sense. But together, we make sense in a world where we show then that forgiveness makes more sense than a world filled with hatred. That the church makes sense in a world that is built on peace than in, in, instead of a world committed to violence. That, it, that the, the church makes sense of the world because we show that generosity makes more sense than greed. See, it's through the church that we demonstrate and we show that it makes sense that forgiveness is, is so much better than bitterness and anger. And that every time when we respond to God in faith and when we do what we were created to do, the world sees things that it doesn't find anywhere else. And so God literally takes us, he takes you, together, all of us, and he's bringing sense, he's making a community where people can find sanity, where something finally makes sense. You know, a place where someone can finally find peace in a world that's losing its mind. In a place where people can finally find love in a world that's so filled with hatred. And God is putting this all on display and he's saying, oh yeah, you think this is, a, you think this is all a, mis a big mistake? Watch them. Watch what happens when I take people who have every right to be hateful, every right to be angry, every right to be greedy, and watch what happens when I come into their life, and you see what happens. Watch what I do with people who are weak. Watch how I make them strong. Watch how I take people that are simple, and I make them wise. Look at how I take people that don't know how to get along, and I teach them how to reconcile. Just watch. And constantly, constantly, constantly he's doing this. Through the church, it makes sense that people who are committed to one another are better off than people who are just looking out for themselves. That's why it's a, it's a community. It makes sense that a community of compassion and kindness and mercy is better than a community built on hatred. Now, this is important. This is so important because some of you stopped believing in God long ago because you said none of this makes any sense. If God is on the throne, then why does my life hurt? Then why do the people I love hurt? Then why are all these bad things happening? And you kind of stay stuck there, but God's like, no, 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 you don't understand. Look, those things are always going to be in the world. What makes sense is when you respond to me. That's when things begin to make sense. And it's only that way that it's going to make sense. Go on to verse 12. He says, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come what? Boldly, boldly and confidently into God's presence. Boldly and confidently into God's presence. See, religion is built on controlling you through guilt and shame. But Jesus came to completely forgive us and to make us sons and daughters, right? Right? You know, for the first few years of my, of my uh, 
uh, Christian walk. Whenever we would be in worship services, and maybe some of you can, can relate to this, I would be singing and praising, and I would be half singing and half apologizing. <laughs> God, you are so awesome. I really didn't do well this week, but you are great, and I am not really great, and you are amazing, and boy, I really blew it, and God, just please don't strike me down. You are beautiful, and if I keep saying good things that will hold him off just for another week, right? <laughs> and what I felt was this. Whenever I was praising God, I, I would see myself the way I was, and I knew what kind of a week I had. And when I would come to him and I was singing, I was, like, ashamed because I was like, I know I didn't, I didn't do my best. I knew, I know that I blew it sometimes. And so I would kind of praise him kind of like this. You know what I'm talking about? And I never really felt that comfortable I praised him because I knew I should, and I praised him because I knew he deserved it, but I never felt like I, I really belonged in his presence. And then one time we were in a church in Nashville called Belmont, and we were in this incredible time of praise and worship, and I was doing the same kind of thing, you know, just, yeah, God, you're great, I'm not, I'm really, really wrong, wretched, you know, and, and I'm like doing this thing. And suddenly, in my mind, God reminded me, there's a verse, and it says, we know that when we see him, we shall be like him, because we will see him as he is. And all in an instant, suddenly, I, I had always had this picture in my mind of standing in my street clothes before this blazing, white, pure light of God, and me looking like this, and him looking like that. And in an instant, I saw myself in the same blazing white robe of righteousness that he had, the same holiness that he had, the same, and, and, I, and I realized that's what that verse is saying. And suddenly, I felt like I belonged in his presence. I didn't feel like an outsider. I didn't feel like I'm groveling my way in. I just felt like, no, I'm home. This is, this is exactly where I belong, is in your presence. And I know that for some of you, you kind of have done the, yeah, okay, God, you're great. Please look the other way, okay? You're great, and I'll sing because I should and because you deserve it. But here's what I want you to know is that when you've allowed Christ to forgive you of your sins and to come in your life, he sees you as a son and a daughter. And that's why he says we can come boldly and with confidence because you belong in the presence of God. That's where you belong. That's where I belong. And it's not about heaping guilt and shame and, oh, go try a little bit harder. He's like, no, I've already forgiven you. You come. You come. You enter my gates with singing, my courts with praise. You come because of, because of Christ. In our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently. Don't you ever think that you can't come to God. Don't you ever think that, oh, I've blown it one time too many. Don't you ever think that. He already knew you were going to blow it. He already decided he wanted you to be his kid. He already decided that your sins were going to be covered. You just keep coming back to him. And he says, so please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you. You should feel honored, which is important because in their minds, so often what they connected was bad experiences are because of sin all the time. Well, Paul's in prison. And to everybody who thinks that bad circumstances are directly connected to sin all the time, it's like he doesn't have much of a platform to stand on. It's like, who are you to talk? You're in prison. What have you been doing when nobody's looking? And Paul says, hey, listen, I'm in prison. I'm in prison because of our faith. Be honored. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You're going to go through bad times too. And it's not always because of sin. It's because life happens, right? He says, so you just keep coming to God. And then here's what he goes on to say. Check this out. This is really big. Because he said, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. We. And every time, every, all through these passages, you're going to see the same thing. Check this out. Verse 14. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts. 
plural, as you trust him, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. You ever wonder why so many of God's promises seem to elude you or why power seems to elude you? You ever wonder why you keep reaching out for it and it just seems out of, a little bit out of reach? I can tell you why. Because if you try to live life on your own and you try to do the Christian life without walking with other people, you are always going to operate in weakness. These, this whole passage, all of these things are spoken to a community. There's, there, listen, there's no dude who's named Ephesians. Okay? This isn't the letter to a guy named Ephesians. Hey, Ephesians, this is all for you. It's written to a community. And most of the scriptures are written to communities. And this is why, by the way, small groups, we're, this isn't just talk. Small groups matter because things, power resides in community. It's not Lone Ranger stuff. Lone Ranger people never flourish in the kingdom of God. They don't. Because what they're saying is, is I don't need anybody else. But what he's saying is, no, this is an all of you thing. This is strength and power that comes through his spirit to all of you, making his home in your hearts, plural, right? Check it out, verse 18. And may you have power, he's continuing his prayer, may you have power to understand as all God's people should. NIV says this, may you have power to understand, or may you have power together with all God's people, how wide and long and high and deep his love is is may you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God he says this is for all God's people this is a community thing any of you any Star Trek fans in here Star Trek Trekkies that's cool man I know it's nothing to brag about is it I hear you snicker okay Star Trek Next Generation Luke Picard Okay, all right, can you guys tell me what this is? The Borg! Thank you very much. The Borg, you, listen, and, and, and the saying of the Borg is, resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. Okay? The Borg, that gigantic thing, that gigantic cube is made up of all of the beings that get caught up by the Borg. And when you go inside the Borg, you'll find rows and rows and stories and all kinds of people that are wired into the Borg. Because what makes the Borg so powerful is that it takes the, all of the, the collective knowledge and experience of everybody that becomes a part of it, and that's where it gets its power from. It becomes nearly invincible because it's, it gets stronger and stronger as more people become a part of the Borg community because now it's taking your knowledge and it's taking your knowledge, it's taking your experience and your experience and it's bringing it all together so that it operates as one entity that is using everybody's experience and knowledge. It's creepy, but that's what the church is. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and for small groups, listen, resistance is futile. If you're not in a small group, you will be assimilated, okay? All right? And so we're going to change the name of the church to the Borg Church, and we'll see what happens. But do you get the picture? Listen. Not one of you, even the most intelligent person in this room, is more intelligent than all of us combined. The richest person is not richer than all of us combined. Right? The wisest person is not wiser than all of us combined. The most loving person or the most generous person are not more loving and more generous than all of us combined. We are stronger together. And the power of God happens in community. He said both, both, both. It's you all, it's you all, it's you all, it's you all together. The power of God resides when you're in community. Listen, sometimes we, we sing songs like this in worship. God, you're all I need. That's wrong. Because I need you. And you need me. And God designed us that way. You go, ooh, ooh, theologically, I'm not sure I agree with that, Pastor. So, 
So let me take you back to the book of Genesis. So God's got Adam there. He has not yet created Eve. And God decides he's going to let Adam name all the animals. You guys know the story. He, he parades animals two by two going in front of Adam. Giraffes. That's what I call those. Rhinos. Rabbits. Yeah, cats. Um, <laughs> And, and he sees them, male and female, male and female, male and female. And God is like, Adam, do you notice anything missing? <laughs> no, I've got ESPN. Everything's awesome, right? It's cool. No, no, keep going, Adam. Okay, elephants, uh, tigers. And Adam, do you notice anything missing? No, everything seems fine to me. Let's just have you take a nap then. I'll fix this, right? <laughs> He's so relationally blind. He doesn't understand. And God puts him to sleep. And then he brings forth out of his rib, woman. And he's, because he said, it is not good for man to be alone. Well, hold it, he had God. Yes, he did. But he was created for more. And so were you. And so was I. And that's why I can't do this on my own, and you can't do it on your own. Because God isn't all you need. We need one another. You were created for it. We were designed for it. And so Paul is saying, this is where the power is, and I pray that you get this. I pray that you understand how wide and long and high and deep his love is. I pray that you get this. I pray that you experience this inner strength, the kind of strength that can only come when you're connected to God and when you're connected to one another. That's where strength comes from. And he says, I want you to, to know all of this. I want you to experience all of this. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts. Your roots will grow down into God's love. And in verse 20, he says this, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within me. Oh, to accomplish infinitely more than I might ask. Oh, we, sorry. Glory to him in me. No. The church church he his power at work within us that when we get together and like i said sunday we're speaking the common language of how god is working in our lives and we love people with the common love the way that christ loves people that there's something so powerful in that that god begins to keep pulling people in and that's my phone ringing while i'm speaking isn't that weird <laughs> I'm, I'm going to call him back, and you guys say hello. <laughs> okay? Yeah, and, and so we're going to do this, okay? <laughs> hello? Hey, um, Ro Robbie, we're doing First Tuesday tonight. Everybody wants to say hi. Say hi to Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll call you back later, okay? I'll <laughs> see you, bye. <laughs> I get to do that. Okay. You don't. You don't. You don't. Okay, so. <laughs> That's awesome. Welcome to First Tuesday, everybody. Hey, by the way, you guys did a great job. That was so cool. That's a first. Okay, so listen. So he says, now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work in within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think glory to him in the church and see we don't like that because we like to say no it's my destiny I don't want anybody getting in in the way of my destiny I just want to achieve and we sing all those songs but you can't you will never experience the full measure of Christ if you choose to do it alone you never will because he didn't design things that way the only way that you and I experience the full measure of Christ is in community. And there's no other way to do it. And so lone rangers that go, I don't do church. Yeah, I don't need a church. I'll just do my own thing. And they think they're more awesome by themselves. Or I know so much, I have nothing to learn from anybody else. I will be glad to bestow upon you wisdom and knowledge. Right? You know what? You know what? 
check this out. Check this out, because I'm, I'm never going to find the fullness of God and everything that God has for me without other people, and neither will you. I want you to read this uh, about, uh, let me, let me let's just continue with this. It says, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly. We saw that, right? And, but if you take a look at Jesus' life and the way that he lived and the way that, that he, he, it says that we're supposed to be patterned after him, we come to him. But there's something that we can learn from him, and this is really important. There's a passage in Philippians that theologians call the kenosis passage, okay, which is a, which is a word that means the emptying. Let me bring you to Philippians chapter 2. Check this out. Listen, really, this is for the, oh, I don't need people. I'm just, I've got all the answers. Here's what he says. Don't be selfish and don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Now, nobody will admit it, but we all have a hard time thinking of other people as better than ourselves. We do. We're just like, better than him. Man, what a mess. Right? Look at them. Look at the way they're doing that. Man, a lot. We, we have a hard time thinking of others as better than ourselves. Let me show you how you can do this. He says, don't, don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. So if there was anybody that would be able to say, boy, my life would be diminished if I were with you. I will bestow upon you knowledge, and, you know, you may receive that. If there's anybody, there's only one person that could ever make that kind of a claim. It's Jesus, right? And look what it says. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up. Gave up. That's the kenosis part. The emptying. He gave up. What did he give up? He gave up his place. He gave up his position, but not his divinity. Not his deity. It says, instead he gave up his divine privileges, he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him, he elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in, every, in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's the point. If you think that you're better than other people, you won't spend time with them. Jesus did not diminish himself when he came to earth. He did not diminish himself when he laid aside his position and his, his place. He didn't lose anything. He added humanity to himself is what happened. He literally expanded his horizons, if you can imagine that. God did not lose anything. He added to himself. And the only way that you can add to yourself and see others as better than yourself is if you realize that people that you stay with, no matter how broken they are, no matter what it is that they're going through, they add something to your life that you need. And maybe it's learning how to love people. Maybe it's learning how not to judge people. Maybe it's learning how to speak wisdom into somebody's life and help them to become better. Maybe it's sharing your experience that, that of how you work through that thing and suddenly you see them being able to apply that and you see them being able to experience the same freedom that you did. But the key is this, is we have to see everyone else, see one another, not as, oh, that's something I got to do. No, you get to add more humanity to your life the way Jesus did. And you get to experience the wealth of those relationships. And the scripture says that because Jesus came that way, he has been exalted to the highest place. You will never reach your highest potential of love if you try to do it by yourself or if you just do it reading books. You've got to be with people. And it is in community that God expresses his deepest love and the, the greatest beauty that happens is when we choose that we're going to live our lives in community. It works the same for all of us. John wrote it this way. And I want you to read this with me, and we'll land with this. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Small groups, community, is not just a thing. This is where the power of God resides. 
It is in those relationships that you and I reach our potential and experience what we could never experience alone. And for some of you, maybe you're here tonight and, and, and maybe you just, you, ne- you just never really trusted God. Maybe some bad things happened in your life and you're like, man, none of this makes sense. But you realize, no, 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 there's something God wants to do in your life. He's going to walk you through this hard thing. And you can trust him. You can. Because he loves you. And he hasn't just given you Jesus. He's given you people who will love you. And walk with you through whatever you go through. That's who we are. That's what the church is. And that's where the power of God is. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes if you would. And tonight, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, if you've, if you've never done that and, and you want to know that you're forgiven and you want to be a part of that amazing, beautiful community that God has created with your eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. If you go, that's, that's what I, I need, Jesus. I need, his, I need that peace. I need that love. Okay? All right? Okay, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay? All right? Okay, I want to pray with you. And right where you are, you could just pray something like this. You can say, dear Lord, thank you for dying for me. I've held you at arm's length. And I've been alone. And I've been weak. And I am so sorry. I ask you to come into my life, Lord. I ask you to pour out your spirit in me. And I ask, Lord, that you would change me from the inside out. And that you would increase my capacity to love like you do. Help me to see the riches of my life, the people that you bring into my life. And let me experience your power in the fullness of what that is. Thank you, God. And for others of you with your eyes closed, maybe you've been playing the Lone Ranger. Maybe you've been afraid of getting close to people. Maybe you've been hurt by being with other people. And so you've been holding back. But tonight you realize that's not going to bring freedom. That's not going to bring what you want. And tonight, tonight you're, you want to you wanna make this, this life, everything that God has for you. And if you are willing to open up your life to relationships, if you're willing to, to, to get to know people, and, and if you're willing to risk being hurt, if you're willing to learn to love, if you're willing to learn to forgive, if you're, if, you're lear- if you're willing to embrace the fullness of God's power in your life and you haven't, then I'm going to ask you right where you are to raise your hand. And if you say, I want that, I want, to, I want those relationships. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. You guys can put your hands down. You can't do it alone. I'm going to pray with you, but there's a step for you. And that's to get into a small group. And just let God lead you in it. But right where you are, I just let's just pray for God to do something amazing through that step. Father, I thank you for those that tonight are choosing to step into the bigger life that you have. The plan, God, your plan. And Father, that you would so envelop them, put them in just a perfect group, Lord. Just cause these spiritual friendships to thrive. And Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to pour out in the lives of those who tonight have decided to take that step. And God, we're asking that more and more you would find in us a community of people so in love with you, so captured by your love, so filled with your spirit. God, that you could bring anybody who needs hope and transform their lives, God. And Lord, we're going to celebrate you all day long doing that. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, and we love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, guys, let's tell God thank you for that. Thank you, Lord.